my sense is that if you take care of the quality of life, then the quantity of life actually takes care of itself. Welcome everybody to the first episode of the Smarter Not Harder podcast, your home to one cent solutions for life's $64,000 questions. Since today is the first episode, we wanted to kick things off with none other than, as I alluded to, and I think the trailer for this episode, the guy who got us all together in the first place, and that's Dr. Theodore Achikoso. Dr. Ted is the founding pioneer of the clinical practice of health optimization medicine and practice. Of course, today we're going to get into what that means. And he's the chief science officer of Smarter Not Harder, Inc., which is the makers of transcriptions. Now, who is Dr. Ted and why would we kick things off with him other than the fact that he got us all together? Well, he entered college at the age of 15 and has trained, researched, taught, worked, or founded companies in biology, medicine, he's a medical doctor, of course, pharmacology, toxicology, interventional neuroradiology, neurology, medical informatics. He's been involved in science and tech investing, groupware, AI-based, foreign exchange, quant trading, interventional endocrinology, anti-aging medicine, nutritional medicine. He's board certified in both of those. And he works with psychedelic plants, consciousness, and pharmaceutical grade supplements, which include the transcriptions brand. Dr. Ted currently maintains a tricontinental health optimization medicine and practice in North America, Europe, and Asia. Maybe we need to add Antarctica in there at some point. And he's chronologically 61, telomerically 32, and epigenetically 22 and a half. So, as this is the first episode, what did we get into on this podcast? Well, there's a bit here on metabolomics, and because genetics is oh so sexy, we unpacked it, unpacked really what metabolomics is, how long it's been around for, and why it's useful in a clinical practice. We looked at the holes in genetics testing, we went through all of the omics, going from genetics all the way down to the metabolome, and why the metabolome is the preferred modality of testing for the health optimization practitioner. And of course, we went into health optimization medicine and practice, what that is, what the curriculum entails, and why it may be interesting to you. But rather than me rambling on about all of these amazing things that Dr. Ted has done in his life, let's just kick things off with that conversation, shall we? Dr. Ted, welcome. Hi, Boomer. It's good to see you again. And... Um... You know, I get, to, I get the pleasure of asking you questions on a recorded line this time. This is fantastic. Yeah, I get the most questions from you unrecorded, so I don't know how you translate them. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. I can't. Uh, we have a definitive source now, so I can't just fake it. Um, but I want to – today I want to cover – a topic called metabolomics that is very, very familiar to us, but is something that for most of the audience may be slightly unfamiliar or something that they've only scratched the surface on. Uh, but before we get into metabolomics, uh, I want to talk about the other omics that most people listening to this have probably heard of, which is genomics or genetics. And you know, genetics, as I understand, or, or I should say, as is advertised, may um, sometimes be misleading. And so if you don't mind just kind of taking us through a little bit about genetics, how you look at genetics within a clinical practice, and then we can uh, take apart or maybe look at some of the reasons why it may not be the be-all to end-all. Yeah, I've always complained that we have become a DNA-centric society, and that's because of our propensity, really. When we look at a cell in a microscope, we tend to focus at what's at the center or what's most prominently stained, right? And that happens to be the nucleus that contains the chromatin material that houses the DNA. And we are weird that way, but at the same time, we're lovable that way because we tend to focus on the foreground and not on the background with which everything is happening. Remember, Boomer, we used to think that the cell was just a bag of chemicals and now with uh, um, imaging and uh, functional studies, we see that it's actually an ordered array uh, of uh, chemical reactions, much like a chemical factory. Uh, that's mm. why we know when a factory, for example, is spewing out toxic 
chemicals, etc., the way the mitochondria does, for example, in spewing out free radicals, uh, as a as a matter of course in in its work, right? Uh, and therefore, we see the need for antioxidants. The same thing for for genetics. Uh, what we're seeing in there is really um, it's just a, a set of uh, instructions or a library, right? Um, for, from which uh, things can be built from inside uh, the cell and uh, can be packaged and be brought out of the cell. Uh, however, we have become too DNA centric, and it's because it's the first thing that we saw, right? Um, and what has happened from hence is that we have developed finer and finer uh, means uh, of detecting what's happening inside the cell. In fact, uh, in, if you t take a look at the history of medicine, much of what we have right now stemmed from the fact that our technology or our instruments were actually uh, geared towards looking at organs, like the ECG, for example, for the heart, or the EEG for the brain. And you take a look at whole organs, and that was because uh, that was a technology afforded us, right? But now the technology has uh, allowed us to take a look at the inner workings of the cell and suddenly all the chemical reactions that we just used to memorize in medical biochemistry or in biochemistry courses can be measured. Uh, we know that, uh, for example, in the uh, Krebs cycle uh, of the inside the mitochondria, uh, we know that this uh, uh, a reaction could not proceed without uh, any particular uh, cofactors that we need. Um, and if you see, we it needs you know vitamin B one, B two, B five, uh, you know B three, B five, lipoic acid, magnesium. All right. See, these are this we we did not focus on this, but. The truth is that when you move away from the genes, you can take a look at what are the other things that we actually eat in terms of nutrition. That's why they're called vitamins. We could not manufacture them, right? Uh, they become significant to the whole process and we could do something immediately about them. In fact, the best way to remember the uh, lower significance of the genes, if uh, I know people will get offended by me saying that, is that you cannot detect um, mercury toxicity from genetics, you know, you have to take a look at the uh, that uh, toxicology profile, or even just a regular mm -hmm. profile uh, that measures uh, some of these uh, heavy metals. They may not be overtly toxic, but you know, uh, and the the farther you move away from the genes, the more you'll see the environmental and uh, physiological factors that are affecting the individual, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, example of environmental factors are pollutants, right? You cannot find pollutants like like a uh, Plastics, etc. Uh, you know uh, the, the pollutants in in uh, in, uh, in uh, exhaust of automobiles and so on, right? Uh, so you you can find those. Just just to interrupt you there for a second, because like you have uh, a lot of these genetic reports, right? Yeah, tell you a little bit about quote unquote detoxification or perhaps a genetics based diet. Yeah. Um, but what are the dangers in that? Because it, it does seem to me like we're making a lot of assumptions around probability there and it's not really telling us what's going on yeah that's a fantastic a question in fact and uh and belies a lot of the decision making that we do right now in um uh, in in medicine in illness medicine itself um uh, in uh, for example if genetics you know, the, the debate between nature and nurture has already been settled a long time ago. You know, any debates that you put out there is actually really fake because you see that the environment completes the blueprint that's been set out there by the genes. Um, and in fact, um, a newer work right now by, by other scientists show that it's not even the genes that are that important rather than the bioelectric circuits that they, uh, they uh, put out there for the construction of uh, structures uh, uh, in, a, in a process they call morphogenesis, right? But here, uh, the uh, process that we are looking at is that, uh, you know, it's an environment that completes the uh, what's put, been put out by, uh, by the genes uh, themselves. So, uh, for example, if you, uh, experiment has already been done where if you shut off the, the eye of a cat, for example, from birth, 
right? And there's a critical window by which the eye needs to be opened in order to admit light so that the environment can actually uh, activate it and can complete its, uh, its uh, reach towards the occipital lobe of the cat's brain. If you don't do that in the critical window, then, you know, the, the cat will be blind even if the eye is open. So you'll see that uh, uh, nature actually completes nurture. And as you can see here, our environment actually defines a lot of, uh, of uh, what happens inside us right? Um, uh, for example, if you are exposed to some bright light or something like that, you could get irritated. Uh, you know, there are a lot of, uh, of uh, toxins out there. So when you look at that, plus the complexity of what's called epigenetics, right? The genes are just basically, okay, I need to to make something and the signals go inside the, the DNA and, um, uh, and, and then uh, it gets uh, converted into uh, by a process of transcription and translation, and then they, they make the proteins, right? And then you could see here, there is the genome, there is the transcriptome, there is the proteome, you know, the transcriptome uh, and, uh, and the proteome, these are things that make things happen, right? And then you have the metabolome then after that, which is which indicates what's happening now. So there's a process from, from the gene to the metabolome um, in, in, in the creation of these structures, but then the signal still has to come from the cell and the signal still has to come from the environment, whether internal environment or external environment, right? And then it, this is complicated by the fact that we now have epigenetics that shows that uh, really, uh, and this is what I mean by uh, really a lot of the decisions that we make are not based on the genes now because uh, there is a thing called the epigenome that uh, regulates uh, the genes outside of of the genome itself and can also be heritable. It can be transferred from mother to child on for several generations. And um, many of these epigenomic changes are due to lifestyle. So, uh, and there are ways of measuring the epigenome, epigenetic age. So you could see there now that uh, even major decisions, like for example, taking off a breast because you have a breast cancer gene. It's a very difficult decision now because before it used to be an easy decision. Yeah, you have to have the, the gene, yeah. you have the propensity for developing it. Uh, then you could, you, you could, you know, you could remove the, the breast and so on. But now it gives you pause, right? Uh, and say, well, you know, we could control this with, uh, with the proper lifestyle, meaning the proper vitamins, nutrients, hormones, etc., and the proper uh, exercise, proper exposure to sunlight and so on, which can then silence this particular uh, uh, cancer gene. So it becomes a difficult decision. Uh, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it. I'm saying that there are other uh, opinions that are contrary to the fact that we should cut off these things, right? Uh, the other thing that uh, makes us, uh, gives us pause is also, for example, we found out that certain uh, anti-cancer medications uh, do not work if you lack like a couple of bacterial strains in your gut microbiota or in gut bacteria, right? And it, because it is the gut bacteria that actually converts them to the active form, there's, uh, uh, there's no way that the body can convert them to the active form that is uh, efficient for uh, cancer cell killing until you provide these two, uh, these two strains of bacteria. So you can see that, you know, it's just if, if uh, when, whereas we used to think of the uh, genes as the pinnacle of things, now we just take a look at them as one of the branches of a tree that we take a look at, right? Uh, there's science uh, that is the trunk, and then there's genomics on one side, transcriptomics, proteomics, and here's metabolomics now. And why do we zero in on metabolomics? Because metabolomics is now testable, right? We can mm -hmm. we can test for uh, the, your levels of uh, of the uh, various. Um, uh, molecules that is produced during your uh, metabolism, right, uh, inside mm -hmm. the cell. And we could do something about it right away. In other words, it's clinically actionable, right? You're not guessing anymore. Uh, if your patient uh, or client has, uh, you know, even uh, 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 subtle toxicities with mercury, you can start detoxifying right away using very mm -hmm. simple uh, tools, like, for example, alpha lipoic acid, which is, a, you know, or, or uh, some, some oral uh, detoxification agent there um, that can uh, aid uh, the uh, removal 
of uh, the heavy metal. So you can be uh, proactive then in uh, doing these things. And you're not really treating a disease. You're just maintaining the balance of what's inside the cell because the cell cannot function without this. Now, uh, the, the important thing here, Boomer, is that we've come we've swung into the extremes, right? We went to the organs first and created the whole edifice of illness medicine around yeah. it. And then we swung to the to the little tiny thing called the gene without <laughs> considering everything else in between. And I'm saying yeah. it's, it's not our fault entirely, right? It's because the development of our uh, technology, our science and technology, and actually new models or new perspectives, you know, um, uh, will will allow us to uh, to move forward with the in-betweens, which are the other branches of the same tree. Um, an example uh, for this is is that, uh, for example, you know, instead of looking at Alzheimer's uh, as a as a uh, as a plaque uh, and and uh, tangle uh, disease, you know, uh, people are now looking at it as an autoimmune disease. And then now you see that much, many of the autoimmune diseases, actually, if you take a look at it, it can be traced to our largest um, um, immune system organ, which is the gut. And the gut metabolites, again, it's a, the, the, the gut bacteria spew out metabolites, which we absorb and we should, we should, which we could detect in our urine, or they could also be detected in stool. So you could see, you could, you could, uh, we, we just looking at the metabolites alone, we do have a way of finding out what the body is doing, uh, right? Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's like, in fact, um, the metabolome, uh, metabolomics has been described as the um, stethoscope of the 21st century, right? Um, you cannot say hi, hello to a molecule, but uh, you know when you when you when you see these things uh, in intervalley, you, you could see them that they are networks. So that's what's important in terms of um, the perspective that you take in metabolomics, right? You shift in perspective mm -hmm. from organ to inside the cell because now your technology allows you to. And the technology is already available to physicians and other uh, non-physician healthcare providers. It's just that people don't know that it's already there. I mean, it's 50 years old for Christ's sakes. I, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, it's about time that we actually take a look uh, at the body at a different level of perspectives. I think most of the fights between illness medicine and um, and people who actually take a look at the metabolome is the fact that they are not seeing that we're looking at the same individual, but at different levels, right? One is looking mm -hmm. at the organ level and one is looking at it from, from um, uh, a molecular level inside the cell. Uh, and what's what's important when you deal with metabolomics is you now very easily see the effect of uh, evolution, right? How how things evolve. For example, uh, you can see that the mitochondria has its own metabolites, right? Has its own DNA and everything else. And you can see that it's really a separate bacterium. So just by using uh, the metabolomics test, it actually pushes you to think about, you know, how we evolved and we evolved essentially as uh, this agglomeration uh, of cells, which, you know, uh, one of the things that we push uh, in um, the specialty that I, uh, you know, that whose framework are created in is health optimization, in health optimization medicine, is it uses this evolutionary lens and and says, well, okay, as an agglomeration of cells, we're actually called the holobiont, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's only now that people are writing about it. We've been railing about it for what, uh, you know, more than 12 years now, but people are finally realizing that because that we have these tools now, we see that, yeah, we have this bacteria in, in, inside our cells, right? We have all of these uh, uh, things that are uh, essentially working in synchrony. And then it forces us to take a look then the, as, as, a, as this group of cells as a cellular network. And then when you're looking them as a cellular network, then you actually virtually have an ecosystem. So that makes us different. For example, illness medicine will take a look at a person and the ecosystem will be the number of uh, pe uh, you know uh, people in the population who have a particular disease, right? Uh, but here, the ecosystem is the individual with all the cells uh, communicating and uh, participating, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I just want to have a little note here. I am not actually down against uh, genetics, right? In fact, I, uh, 
I, I have a CRISPR Cas9 lab that I played with, you know, uh, inserting genes into uh, into bacteria uh, because mm-hmm. I, I think it's a, a major uh, uh, achievement uh, in our time to do uh, uh, CRISPR technology. Um, but it's very important, especially in those diseases that produce misfolded proteins that will affect, you know, the structure and function uh, of the individual and are unable to survive or will have a short survival because of that, right? So in terms of, it's it's kind of like illness medicine. Illness medicine is really good for acute uh, infections and for trauma, right? For but a dismal record for chronic diseases. Uh, it's the same thing for, uh, for uh, genetics. I think think is it will have a very good track record for repairing um, you know uh, genes that uh, give us uh, morphological uh, disturbances uh, that affect uh, or physiologic disturbances that then uh, affect uh, the quality of life and the lifespan of the person so uh, I, again uh, here uh, you know uh, many people might disagree with me but uh, in terms of the clinics, I think that is what is important now. Maybe we could take take a look at uh, you know a gene editing later as a mechanism by which we could have foreverly large muscles or however you wanna you, you know uh, like uh, you know uh, like the case of the woman. I don't know what happened to her now who uh, inserted the folistatin gene, right? Uh, so it's you know, the, there's also a lot of bodybuilders and myostatin knockouts, right? So yeah. Uh... So we don't we don't know the effect of those yet right mm-hmm. and people who are willing to do you know n equals one studies well god bless them um you know that's what we had to do initially for uh metabolomics tests because the tests were very expensive at the time and then the supplements were very expensive at the time but then as more and more uh, people started to use the tests which is the testing of your uh vitamin mineral uh levels and the test of your metabolites uh then the prices with the testing came down you can now do some self-testing in some cases and it tells exactly how much of vitamins minerals cofactors and hormones you need right so uh so that's been the evolution it's kind of like the evolution of the mri you know from four thousand dollars a pop to four hundred dollars a pop uh and, this and you is, may have had first experience first-hand experience at the establishment of the mri right so, yes yes I mean, uh, from the beginning Yes, uh, the MRI is an exciting uh, piece of technology. Uh, and, and it's funny when uh, I used to take a residence on rounds and they would like proudly show me how they 3D rotate an MRI and much of that work I actually did in the registration of the MRI and how to interpolate the, the values in between slices so you could get a 3D image. You know, I am that old. So, uh, <laughs> Chronologically, that old. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that's that's the uh, the the whole uh, picture in there is that as we use this to uh, see as you boomer the, the the thing here is as you go down to the cellular level, the cell actually uh, is the foundation of all the other cells in the body. You know, and your neuron is a specialized cell producing uh, other specialized stuff, but. Everything else uh, in the body is made up of uh, all of these cells. So no one actually takes care of these cells. And so I said, well, we had to have a specialty that takes care of basic cell, the nucleus, the mitochondria, cytoplasm, you know, the cell membrane. And what do we do? Uh, what do we use in order to monitor what's going on? And that's where we use metabolomics, right? Because it shows us exactly what's going on inside the cell. And that technology is available and affordable enough for us to do it. And when we do this, we see that we naturally have to move away from disease because disease is basically organ base you have a heart disease you have a, a chronic neurodegenerative disease and so on but here it's you move away from disease into health right is your cell uh, uh, healthy or unhealthy you know it ha- does it have a balanced metabolites and we also since we look at uh, things from an evolutionary lens uh, we see that there is a, a you know a, a paper on um, uh, on the cell danger response right uh, mm-hmm. that where uh, it is discussed that the uh, metabolites are actually the primary drivers of the cell danger response. The cell danger response is uh, essentially just a set of uh, eight things that the cell does in order to protect itself, 
right? Mm -hmm. And you could see that what drives this protection of the cell is are actually metabolites. And you could measure these metabolites and see what's going on inside the cell. See, uh, what is missing right now in illness medicine is the concept of, uh, of balance, right? The concept of network, the concept of balance. Uh, and you could see that the body actually has uh, a, a way of uh, inflaming itself because that's its uh, first defense against any uh, insult or injury, right? There's an inflammation, whether of the molecular type or the gross type, right? And, and, then, um, and then when you remove the stressor, right? Uh, when you remove this, the, the stressor, then the body will kick in its uh, healing pathway and say, okay, now uh, it's time to actually put in the anti-inflammatory uh, molecules uh, out there. Mm -hmm. So when, when, when you do that, and, and there are master regulatory genes that uh, regulate this, which means that they've been there for uh, before we even became human, you know, these master regulatory genes are there because they are that important, right? Uh, they are that important to the body. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, so you see that the body knows how to balance itself. It's us. We know how to imbalance ourselves without realizing that we're imbalancing ourselves, right? Uh, with the in invention of uh, light, for example, we have imbalanced our, our sleep. And as you know, lack of sleep will raise your inflammatory molecules called cytokines in the body. So, and this can be detected, right? Uh, they are, uh, metabolites can be detected and you could put in appropriate measures like now you're saying, you know, an anti-inflammatory diet or uh, uh, antioxidant or, you know, um, uh, 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 nutrition that actually is rich in uh, what is deficient uh, mm -hmm. in uh, your client or your patient. So, so that's, that's, that's the reason why metabolomics is so important is that aside from the fact that it tells us what can be done with the client or the patient right now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it actually pushes us away from the disease mode of thinking and saying, what is good for the fundamental cell that is the basis of all the other cells in the body, right? What, you know, how do I balance it? Um, and with that, there's also this evolutionary pr perspective that's at the, at the back of it. For example, one of the things that we think about when we uh, look at cancer cells, right, is that uh, it, it a cell wants to survive and reproduce, right? It's only because it's in a network. That's why it is constrained by the, it has agreed to be uh, constrained uh, by the network, right? For the functioning of the ecosystem. But when you say, uh, 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 have toxins in there that, uh, you know, that we classify as, uh, you know, a carcinogenic, these are carcinogens, et cetera. They basically irritate the cell so much, but the cell's primary directive is still, hey, I want to survive and reproduce and uh, it will try its darndest best to reproduce, right? So you put yourself, not as boomer, the individual, but you are now boomer the cell and say, I want to survive and reproduce. So it, you will turn yourself into you will you will uh, try to evade all the controls of the network and then you will you will reproduce and that's uh, one of the uh, one of the ways we can take a look at uh, cancer cells from an evolutionary perspective right so mm -hmm. uh, so from the view of the cancer cell well yeah I am happy I'm surviving or producing but from the view of the individual that's why I said we're talking at different levels here it is actually detrimental to you, right? So mm -hmm. it's detrimental to, to the individual, but it is advantageous to the cancer cell. So you have to flip perspectives here. Uh, and that's why, uh, as I said earlier, I think the fights between illness medicine and health optimization medicine and other healthcare practitioners who are looking at the body as a holobion is that they are not realizing that they're talking past each other. One is looking at the importance of the organ and the other is, uh, look, is just saying, well, those organs are made up of cells and cells make up all of the body. So it took me three years to actually shift uh, away from a disease mode of thinking, um, having, um, you know, a poked brains for a living for a long time as an interventional neuroradiologist. Uh, but it takes a while because you trip, right, uh, immediately, because the tendency is you go to a doctor or a healthcare practitioner only if there's something that ails you. 
right? Mm -hmm. But now we are saying, no, uh, a tune-up is now available. Uh, uh, as I like to say, in fact, cars are a lot better because a warning light comes on, you know, where you have, say, your windshield wiper, windshield wiper fluid is already low or, you know, this is low or service time, it's uh, 3,000 miles. And we used not to have those warning lights, but now we do. Right. Uh, in, in terms of metabolomics and say, OK, you have low alpha lipoic acid, you have low magnesium, you have this, you have that. It's just like a dashboard in a car and the car will run just as our body will run. Right. But it's not running uh, as efficiently or as healthily as we'd like to say. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in that. And the uh, this this uh, particular um, ways by which the cells do things, uh, I, I said, is defined by evolution. But you know that the, but by evolution, we always have this way of uh, essentially uh, uh, optimizing our fitness function, right? In fact, yeah. most of us maximize uh, the fitness function, meaning what will allow us to survive and what will allow us to re reproduce, right? So mm -hmm. that's, the, that's a kind of um, uh, uh, principle. Uh, first principle that's at the back of our minds when we're using metabolomics, when we're using um, when we're using um, uh, the practice of uh, the clinical practice of of clinical metabolomics as a clinical practice, mm -hmm. right? Uh, is that all of these are I have actually uh, a basis for how we evolved and and in evolutionary medicine, for example, it's like we we do ask the question like uh, you know why uh, how do we get sick? Right, because mm -hmm. there are, we are the the fundamental assumption in uh, in in us is that we are not perfect. Uh, and the fundamental assumption in uh, illness medicine we are perfect at this as it is, and that's why you get sick. That's why in medical school or in in uh, in uh, you know uh, um, uh, allied health uh, school you're not taught at how to maintain an engine or how to optimize an engine like like the body. You immediately go, okay, this is a structure, this is a function, then this and, and, and now it's running, and this is how it gets sick. And we simply do two things: we give drugs, surgery, or a combination of both. No matter how teeny weeny the devices are, or how we coat stents and all of that, that's still just a combination of pharmacology and surgery, right? But what we're saying mm -hmm. here is that yes, there's a way to uh, to detect what the cells are doing, and there's a way to keep the body healthy, right? For 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 because what I'd like to say is you know either we we uh, uh, take care of the quality of life or we take care of the quantity of life, and my sense is that if you take care of the quality of life, then the quantity of life actually takes care of itself, right? Uh, uh, because uh, we have this uh, notion that we have to preserve life at all costs, even if we already know that there are outcomes worse than death, right? Mm -hmm. Those those are already very well known. So uh, uh, so if you start with the quality of life, and even if you have to spend a little bit more on the quality of our lives, then you know it makes living worthwhile, doesn't it? Uh, absolutely. All right. So. Uh, Ted, you basically just took us on a very long journey here into metabolomics, and I want to unpack some of this for people and kind of give a, a little bit more of a sense on how this fits into the overall health optimization uh, medicine practice framework. So you've we've talked about the sort of the um, unit of selection here, in this case being the cell. Mm -hmm. And how do you, so you've mentioned the lab test results and how you're able to identify, um, detect and correct and balance networks, but how does it fit into uh, the, the rest of how you work with a client, for instance, um, on their chronobiology? How does it, how does metabolomics fit into uh, that environment, if you will, the um, bioenergetics of it? Can we connect the dots for people um, just to give them a sense of the complete framework and why uh, that unit of selection uh, remains the cell and why that's particularly important? Yeah, um, okay. Um, 
let's take a look at, you know, we were discussing about clinical metabolomics. So essentially, let's take a look at the practical side of it. You essentially submit blood, urine, and stool, and they detect the metabolites in them, right? So and, oh, metabolites are small molecules that are the result of the processing of the cell and of, uh, uh, of its uh, particular uh, 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 work, right? Uh, uh, now this this processing requires uh you know uh vitamins minerals cofactors etc in order to proceed well uh and also remembering that as we age you know um uh, our enzymes do not work as as uh, robustly as they did when we were younger right and that's why uh, and our, our organs begin to fail that's why you know um, you have menopause for example so you can see that uh, uh, all of all of these things are uh, detectable uh, but via the metabolites you know the quality of your gut bacteria for example is detectable through metabolites and so is the integrity of your of your uh, gut in in fact um, one of the most puzzling uh, things that um, uh, students in health optimization uh, talk to me about is that you know, Dr. Ted, why are all, all of these things, all the metabolites of the of this uh, client of mine, all over the place? Like there's like def uh, there's like deficiency in everything, or there's uh, so much toxins in everything, and you could immediately see that there is actually a leaky gut, right? So you could see mm -hmm. the 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 effect of uh, all of these things just by looking at a network picture of something. So. Uh, as, as you said, you know, how does this all fit into the framework? This is the, the, the detection mechanism by which we could, we could uh, uh, correct uh, borderline uh, uh, deficiencies and subtle toxicities. You know, we're not uh, uh, curing any disease. We're just restoring something, something to balance. So uh, by, by in that case, we need an, actually a reference. You know, what's the reference by which we are going to push back all of these values? Say, what's the value of uh, uh, testosterone that you need to, to push the patient back to? What's the value of uh, um, vitamin B12 that you should push the patient back to, right? Um, because as you know, vitamin B12 is produced only by your uh, colonic bacteria, right? So. Mm -hmm. Um, so w when when uh, when you take a look at uh, at it that way, you see that the framework actually relies on metabolomics to do the detection, and of course the nutritional correction because you'll see there are the deficiencies of vitamins, minerals, uh, and so on, right? Uh, cofactors and so on. So if you take a look at you know, so we consider that as one pillar of health optimization. Uh, the the other pillar, of course, will be your mitochondria or bioenergetics because they are the ones producing uh, essentially uh, the, the energy in your body to um, uh, to be able to do what you want to do. Uh, and I'd like to emphasize this always that your Department of Defense has the largest energy budget. So your immune system actually consumes uh, a lot of, of your energy. And if you have a very poor mitochondrial function, you actually see that you're actually more prone to disease, right? Um, uh, you, you're more prone to uh, brain fog. You're more prone, uh, aside from the fact that you know your 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 thyroid hormone levels may be low. But you know if they're normal, that they probably take a look at the uh, mitochondria. And you'll see that there is probably some mitochondrial dysfunction in there. And by simply correcting certain metabolites in in your mitochondria, you could or instituting uh, a lifestyle change like intermittent fasting, for example, you could see. Uh, um, uh, a better mitochondrial function. So, but it's crucial to have a baseline to know what what the mitochondria is doing. You, you don't know, uh, you know, the reason why it's not uh, turning around is that you know it's you have arsenic or zinc that's just uh, mm -hmm. uh, inhibiting the the flow of the uh, uh, tricarboxylic acid cycle in there. And and then uh, of course uh, very close to it is one the first thing that we take a look at in 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 any uh, client or patient is the um uh, is a gut bacteria right the bacteria throw off metabolites and they're absorbed by the body and you could see uh uh both th both of those in uh urine uh it, you know and you could also see that in um uh, and you could also see that in stool right so and gut bacteria they're about uh you know uh, uh 
2.2 kilos uh, inside the body. Mm-hmm. They're a significant, significant organ in themselves. And in them, you could see whether or not your your gut ecosystem actually uh, is actually contributing to a lot of the immune dysfunction in the body. And that's how you, you take a look, you, you can actually very easily correlate, uh, you know, um, the uh, immune diseases with uh, dysfunctional gut, right? Um, and, and then you have, uh, of course, uh, uh, their uh, exposomics, right? Exposomics is a study of the toxins, but it's currently a PhD thing, right? So I made it clinical in the framework by saying, you know, the unit of uh, of selection in the PhD stuff is the gene and everything around it is the exposome or the sum total of your environmental exposures. Uh, but the uh, for us, the unit of exposure is the cell in itself. So, and everything around it. So, your exposure to, uh, for example, for exposure to x-rays, your exposure to cigarette smoke, your exposure to, to toxic fumes, etc. All of those are part of your exosome and even your exposure to uh, toxic people. So uh, that all is as part of your... That's a big part, that's a big part of the exosome. <laughs> yeah, exosome. And you could actually see, right? For example, heavy metal toxicity is uh, the more mm. common thing that we look at here. And they are uh, part of the metabolomics panel that you look at if you take a look at the toxic panel, right? Uh, and they are not significant clinically to produce, uh, you know, to, to produce acute toxicity, uh, signs and symptoms, but they are uh, significant enough to for the patient or your client to complain about muscle fatigue uh, or weakness and, uh, and so on. And we just attribute it to, you know, uh, we just tell them to take more coffee or whatever, um, or exercise more, but it's actually something uh, like that is occurring in the client or the patient. Um, so so for, for chronobiology, you know, um, uh, there are many people uh, who are now trying to co- uh, complete what's called the chronobiome or what's produced, the metabolites that are produced during sleep. You know, it's still very early uh, in in the whole uh, uh, process, but we could see that uh, lack of sleep is already known to produce, uh, you know, uh, inflammatory cytokines, uh, which are the metabolites of inflammation. And you could see how that actually impacts us. Right. And then you have, of course, um, evolutionary medicine, which we uh, touch on earlier. Uh, and on a mm-hmm. clinical sense, we are looking there at the cell danger response. Right. How how is the cell uh, responding to stress? And as uh, we said earlier, uh, the way you take a look at how the health cell is responding to stress is taking a look at the metabolites and what their levels are. Uh, and, and that's the primary driver of the cell danger response, right? So you can see then the, again, the role of the uh, clinical metabolomics in there. And then uh, in epigenetics, you could see, you know, uh, the methylation, uh, DNA methylation is one of the uh, mechanisms, major mechanisms, acetylation is another one of them, you know, um, people may have uh, read a recent paper of, uh, you know, um, uh, sodium uh, acetate uh, actually helping out uh, uh uh, making the epigenome a little bit younger. Uh, however, you know, uh, don't put uh, sodium acetate on your food yet. Uh, it's a, a normal food additive. It's a normal food preservative. But again, you could see there the major pathways. You know, we, we all are were taught uh, one way or another as healthcare providers of what the uh, methylation uh, cycle looks like, right? Uh, it's uh, uh, so, uh, you know, it's uh, very much tied in with the re- regeneration of your uh, cysteine and homocysteine and, and, and so on. And of course, to your urea cycle. So you could see those, uh, you know, and, and you could see the methylation adjustments that need to get done, right? Um, an example that you could have is, for example, many of the people, actually majority of the people have very lazy um, uh, uh, folate uh, enzymes genetically, right? And mm-hmm. you need four four cleavage steps to produce the active form uh, of uh, called methyl tetrahydrofolate. And you could see that even if you take the genetic test and say, well, okay, you have li- really lazy genes for doing that, right? Uh, but a lot of people that make that excuse, right? I have MTHFR. Yeah. So if, if yeah, and majority of people will have that, right? But what do you yeah. do? There's still only a single solution to it, which is when you measure their, uh, your, their, um, uh, uh, figlu, the, the uh, metabolite that actually indicates it, right? Um, 
you could see that, uh, well, the vitamin B9 levels are low and you still have to supplement with uh, anti, uh, with a method that are high to folate, no matter what the gene testing says, because your levels are low, right? Uh, you cannot do CRISPR yet on that particular, uh, particular gene at the moment. Um, uh, but maybe for the newer embryos, they may want to have to do something like that. I, 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 I the ethics board will kill me for saying that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it seems like we should drop this podcast in some of those forums where people are very, very mentally scared about MTHFR. So, yeah. So those are what I call the seven pillars of, uh, um, uh, of a health optimization medicine, right? Because just by focusing on the cell, you see that you're already, you can provide not only uh, supplementation of vitamins, minerals, cofactors, factors, hormones, but you could also immediately uh, uh, put in, couple in the lifestyle changes that need to get made. Yeah. That's, the, that's my fight with lifestyle medicine is that if they don't go deep enough, it's like, well, and it's always a lifestyle to change a particular disease, right? And no, you know, the lifestyle that you do, for example, yeah, sleeping early, sleeping, uh, uh, optimal sleep, optimal um, nutrition, optimal supplementation, optimal exercise, you know, optimal sunlight, optimal grounding, optimal, you know, uh, detoxification and meditation and, and so on. They don't only affect diseases, you know, they have actually are, uh, they're actually fundamental to your health. So you could see how metabolomics, which is one of the pillars of health optimization, along with uh, other pillars, you know, epigenetics, um, uh, bioenergetics or mitochondria, gut immune system, um, exposomics, chronobiology, and um, evolutionary medicine, they are all uh, working together, right? With your core detection mechanism being metabolomics uh, and also your core correction mechanism because they will show you how much, uh, uh, how much uh, uh, deficiencies or toxicities you will have to work through. Um, and for those people who are still insisting on genes, you know, I know there's a human genome database. Uh, we all know that. You should need to know that there's also a human metabolome database. And you need to know that one of the fastest growing segments in that database is um, makeup, cosmetic toxins, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that is a little bit more significant than finding new genes, I think, in terms of us who are adults, right? So the practice itself of uh, health optimization medicine is very simple. So you measure the metabolic levels, right? You shift them. You cannot just shift one because it's a network, right? If you shift one, then everything else in the network will move. You have to shift the entire network, right? Mm -hmm. To the values to between ages uh, 21 to 30 years old because it's supposed to be your golden period, right? And it's the best period that we can uh, probably cite right now because the newer studies show that even at age 30, our hormones are already uh, out of whack, right? In yeah. fact, I'm seeing patients in their 19, 20, 21 years of age with, wow. with growth hormone levels as uh, old as in their 70s. So uh, you, you could see how, how changes in, in uh, our environment uh, can, can uh, this, is, this is due to the endocrine disruptor uh, chemicals, right, in our environment. And then after that, you, you, you then uh, correct the entire network uh, using very simple, uh, you know, it's what I call network-wide range shifting. You shift the entire range of values to between 20 and 30. And ratio correction, uh, that's a, a also a big part in um, uh, health optimization medicine, is we like to correct by ratio, not by absolute value. Uh, for example, many doctors now are prescribing too much omega-3. So when you do a metabolomics uh, of the lipid component, you see that there is excess omega-3 and very little omega-6. And now you have to give like uh, evening primrose oil or something for three months or so in order to shift that balance right back. Right. Uh, in the same way, for those who are physicians who are doing uh, hormones and hormone balancing, you know, we know that there's a testosterone estrogen ratio of two is to one in men, and when that flips to uh, to uh, to uh, in 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 value, you know that your patient or your client is very much susceptible to prostate cancer, and if you correlate that with, uh, for example, the uh, 
uh, lipid peroxidation and the DNA peroxidation tests that we could do uh, and it's detectable again by metabolomics how how fast your chromosome or your DNA and how fast your lipid is rusting you could see then way ahead of time the cancer vulnerability of your patient or your client. So you have an indicator immediately, but you don't do, you don't alarm the patient. You don't do that, uh, you know, by drugs right away. You do it with the natural uh, uh, substances, what they call the bioidentical uh, um, substances, the same things that are used by the body right? But they bioactive, like for example, the body doesn't use folic acid, it cleaves it into uh, four times before it gets into methyl tetrahydrofolate. Uh, so you give methyl tetrahydrofolate like right away, that's an example of a, a bioidentical and bioactive substance, right? So uh, we, uh, you know, on, on, the, on the first instance, that's how you correct, you use bioidentical and bioactives. And then in the second instance is you use your botanicals, like your, your plant supp plant-based supplements, or even your probiotics, right? Uh, they are live bacteria. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's your third line when you use the drugs. And you also need to shift, Bloomer, you also need to shift your thinking uh, about this in terms of, uh, you know, w when, when you are looking at, uh, you know, bioidenticals, uh, uh, and then uh, pharmaceuticals and fungiceuticals, and then and then you use the drugs. You are not actually going against uh, the illness medicine. It's just that uh, you know the question that has been asked of me that really sticks with me is that when uh, when uh, physicians ask me how are my vitamins, minerals, and supplements uh, going to be affected by. Uh, uh, how are vitamins, minerals, and supplements uh, going to affect their drug therapy? And the answer mm -hmm. to that is the reverse. You know, their drugs have never been seen by the body in evolution or by the cells yeah. in evolution, right? And so they have to tell us instead how their drugs are going to affect the vitamin, mineral, uh, and cofactor levels. An example of this is like, you know, um, within two or three days after giving... Um, a contraceptive pill to a female, I usually am called and say, hey, you know, my patient is really very depressed. And if you take a look at the, just the biochemical pathway of it, you know, um, estrogen or estrogen substitutes uh, or, uh, or combinations um, will, will actually um, uh, uh, sequester vitamin B6, right? And B B6 mm. is necessary for the production of your serotonin. And if you give them a high dose, high, high enough dose of vitamin B6, the depression goes away. You don't even have to to treat them with antidepressants. There are many mm -hmm. cases like this, right? Uh, you know, in the winters, we tend to give, take in too much zinc to prevent a cold. And in, in, in the process, we actually uh, 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 yeah, secrete out our copper. So the body does everything in ratios and balances, you know, so when we're doing the balancing, in fact, we are in fact doing balancing, not only of the network, but of the various ratios within it. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Dr. Ted, because I know you have to go, you've been very generous with your time here today, but also uh, because we've also inundated people with so much information, I, I want to pick your brain on one last question. I don't think I've actually ever asked this to you uh, before or of you. Uh, Health Optimization Medicine and Practice Association is structured as a nonprofit. Um, you could have very well gone and done this by yourself in private clinic for the rest of your life, really. Why did you decide to formalize the education and why particularly nonprofit? Well, um, there are several things. Um, actually, the first thing is, um, I'm ashamed to say it, I was, um, uh, I was very mad uh, because I was uh, lecturing on mitochondria and uh, the, the professional regulation commission said I couldn't get um, a continuing medical uh, education credits for it because it was mitochondria. The physicians should know that. That's basic. As if there was no more movement in the basic sciences. And that really, really fired me up. Really very angry uh, because many of the clients and patients that I was seeing were actually uh, had, had some dysfunctions in their mitochondria. Um, uh, and, and then uh, the second part of it is that I actually had a lot of these questions like, is vitamin E good for me? Is vitamin C good for me? Et cetera, et cetera. I said, can we measure this stuff? Uh, and where can we hang all of this? And then the whole biohacking movement was uh, about to go on then, et cetera. And said, you know, 
how what what framework can we hang all of the things that make sense right something that's actually someone who actually wants to take care of someone else how can they put this all together by first principles right and what can we use as an objective measure to present to the illness medicine world that we have an objective measure of health not disease right and metabolomics was that and then after I saw metabolomics and I saw all the other things that were all rounded and put them into the seven pillars. So that's what pushed me. And then I said, well, you know, I got to fund this stuff. Um, and, uh, and so uh, I started uh, Smarter Not Harder, um, which uh, actually it makes the prescriptions brand of products. And, you know, in, um, in health optimization medicine, you know, you didn't get to that state of health overnight. You know, so we cannot get you into a state of health overnight. It usually takes about three, six, nine months before you achieve a state of balance. Some even as and long. And that's as in the most. That's the most diligent clients, right? Yes, yes. Those are those are really highly motivated, and they really follow the protocol. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, for some um, actors and, and uh, rulers of state and so on, you have to follow their lifestyle. So it takes about a couple of years. But uh, for, for people who are actually a little bit more disciplined or, uh, you know, a little bit more militaristic in the way they implement their protocols, but not in the way they think. Right. Um, uh, would actually uh, get that benefit sooner. That's because the, the blood uh, cells, of course, replenish themselves every three to four months. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so when I when when uh, I said, well, this has got to be funded, and 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 so I started this. I, I saw that the products that the health optimization medicine uh, needed were those for things that were acute, like anxiousness, right, sleeplessness, or pain, and. Uh, or, uh, or or just uh, you know brain fog without any uh, without any um, uh, thyroid issues or uh, or um, people who actually want to get out of their ADHD medications right uh, and, and in fact um, you know um, I have uh, uh, some cases where I have taken them out of their ADHD medications uh, you know using supplementation and so. This is the this is the thing that uh, so health optimization medicine in practice drives those products of um, that are being um, uh, made by smarter not harder uh, via the descriptions brand right so so for for uh, every for every time you buy into there we actually donate quite a bit back to health optimization medicine so this is what I call the reciprocity model and I think is the enlightened way of doing business. Uh, these days, mm -hmm. you know, some people say, well, they will donate to charity, their business will donate to charity, but they never do. Uh, that's the reality of it. But here, because we present it both as a reciprocity model, one will not exist without the other. One is a yin, which is education. One is a yang, which is producing profit, right? And they are actually reciprocal to each other. And I think it's the best way for now of doing uh, business in an enlightened world. Uh, beautiful. Uh, Dr. Ted, thank you for sharing this uh, creative genius, brilliance, and wisdom today. Um, of course, we're going to rope you back. This is not just the last time you're going to be on the podcast. So thank you for uh, taking the time today to walk us through Metabolomics, and we look forward to the next conversation. Thank you, Boomer. Thank you for having me. Everybody, have a wonderful and enlightened day. This has been another episode or the first episode of the Smarter Not Harder podcast. If you enjoyed the show, can you please head over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your shows and leave us a five-star review. And while you're at it, if you're on YouTube, click subscribe. Well, we got into a lot in this episode, everything from metabolomics to genetics, health optimization, medicine, practice, and a whole bunch in between. There's a lot we covered. There's a lot we didn't cover. And I suspect that Dr. Ted will be back for more. Thank you again for tuning in to the Smarter Not Harder podcast, your home for one cent solutions to $64,000 questions. Yeah.